Okay, hello okay. everybody. Um, sorry, I can't see people's faces. I can just see my PowerPoint. So I don't know who that's talking to me. But <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for coming along. It's really nice of you to give up your evening for an hour or so for this. Um, I hope it's going to be interesting. Um, it's really nice to be able to share with you uh, what I've been up to. I know a few of you in the audience are people who have helped me out with field work a bit, um, accommodation and this kind of local knowledge. Um, so it's really nice to be able to show you a bit what I've been up to in a sort of more visual way. Um, so in this presentation, I'm just going to first give you some general background on seagrass and then go into some more details of what I've been doing in the PhD so far. So first of all, what is seagrass? Um, probably lots of you already know this, but it's worth starting with the basics. So seagrass is different from seaweed. Seaweed um, has something called a hold fast, so it can hold onto rocks. Um, whereas seagrass um, is not algae, it's related to land plants, um, flowering plants called angiosperms. So it's related to daisies and sunflowers and grasses that make meadows on land. Um, so this means it has flowers, it has roots, and it has things called rhizomes, just like a strawberry. So it can grow, um, the rhizomes grow um, horizontally underground, which means it can reproduce asexually and therefore like spread quite quickly in an area. Um, so seagrass evolved from land plants. They moved back into the sea, well not back, just into the sea um, about 100 million years ago. And there are about 70 species of seagrass around the world. They are found on all continents except Antarctica. Um, but in the UK, we have just two um, called Zostra marina and Zostra nortii. Um, and yeah, those are the ones found in Scotland as well. So why is seagrass important? So seagrass is something called an ecosystem engineer, which means it's a species that significantly modifies a habitat. Um, so the presence of just one single species of seagrass can completely transform bare sediment into a structurally complex habitat, which can be home to lots of different species. Um, and partly because of this, um, it can produce lots of ecosystem services. So those are just natural processes or components of an ecosystem that directly or indirectly benefit people. Um, and these are some of the ecosystem services that seagrass creates. Um, it stabilizes sediment um, in the roots and rhizomes. Um, it can protect coastlines. So the leaves literally buffer wave action. So um, coastlines get less energy from waves. Um, Seagrass can purify water, so it absorbs nutrients from water um, and also traps bits of sediment that um, are mixed around in the water so um, it can improve water clarity. Um, it's also a pretty good carbon store. Um, I would say the carbon storage thing has been a little bit overblown, so I, I urge some caution on that. There's a slightly um, misleading figure which has been around which you might have seen saying that seagrass can store carbon um, up to 35 times faster than tropical rainforest. Um, but see to do something. Um, yeah, that is a very misleading figure where they've compared two conflated things. Um, I can explain more about that if you want. Um, but nonetheless, seagrass is an important carbon store. Um, so it's really important that we particularly protect existing seagrass meadows, which have stored carbon maybe for hundreds of years. Um, so that's not all released into the water and the air again. Um, seagrass also supports fisheries. So it's a nursery habitat, which means um, little baby fish like to live there because they're a bit protected from predators. And then when they're larger, they um, move out into open waters where they're caught by fisheries. Um, although some fishing also happens in seagrass meadows itself themselves, particularly um, in other countries, sometimes seagrass can actually be more important for fishing than coral reefs even. Um, and then of course, seagrass is super important for biodiversity um, and it is a unique ecosystem in itself and um, supports a unique suite of species. So it needs protecting for that sake as well. However, the UK has lost at least 44% of its sea grubber seagrass cover since 1936, um, when there was a big die off due to um, seagrass wasting disease, which was made worse by nutrient pollution. Um, but we could have lost over 90% of seagrass if you look further back in time, um, due to lots of causes, including dredging and anchoring. Um, so therefore, we're of course losing all of these lovely ecosystem services as well. So it's really important we protect what we have left and 
we restore it as well. Um, and you may have heard of various restoration projects which are happening around the UK, which is super exciting. Um, there are two cool ones in Scotland, um, Restoration Falls happening in the Firth of Forth and um, Sea Wilding, which is over near Oban. So why do I focus on biodiversity? Um, understanding of biodiversity supported by seagrass meadows in the UK is quite spatially limited. Um, most of the research until quite recently was focused on England and Wales with very little from Scotland. Um, and it was also taxonomically limited um, with most of the information on fish and invertebrates and other species not getting so much focus. Um, and then why is this biodiversity data important? Often people ask me like, why do we need to look at biodiversity? We just know it is biodiverse. How much more do you need to know? But actually this is important for lots of reasons. We need to be able to attract change over time so we can see if some meadows are declining or getting better, what we need to aim for. Um, we might be able to identify some indicator species to make monitoring easier. So if we can look at uh, one species and that indicates the rest of the habitat is probably biodiverse as well, that could be really useful. Um, biodiversity data can inform policy, for example, to prioritise areas to protect. Um, biodiversity data is important for justifying funding. Um, for example, there's going to be quite a lot of biodiversity credits available in the near future, probably, for example, from offshore wind farms. And we need biodiversity data to be able to get those credits um, funding seagrass projects. Um, and then all of this together supports protection and restoration of seagrass. And this picture on the right is one from Sky from last year, 2022, with a juvenile pollock and some two spot gobies in the background. Um, but the long yellow weed on the right, that's not seagrass, that's um, I think mermaid's tresses. Okay, so here's just a very simple overview of what my PhD is trying to do. I wanna know firstly, who is living in the seagrass meadows in Scotland? Um, who's visiting them more briefly to feed on things? And how can we monitor this biodiversity? Are there some new methods we could use to make it easier? Um, this is an overview of my study sites. Um, so I have six study sites across Scotland that I visited uh, in 2022 and then this summer. Um, I've got three subtitle sites. Um, so that means meadows which are always underwater. Um, and then three intertidal sites, which are ones which are exposed at um, low tide. And as it happens, the subtitle ones are on the west coast, the intertidal ones are on the east coast. That's mostly just a uh, result of the geography of Scotland um, and not deliberate, um, but could create some confounding factors, unfortunately. Um, yeah, and each of these locations is linked with some kind of organisation, whether it's a community group or a conservation organisation or a historical organisation. Um, so I can hopefully provide information which is local, for, um, sorry, useful for these groups in particular. Um, and I chose these sites um, mostly by word of mouth, um, RJ Lilly from Project Seagrass um, gave me a lot of advice of who to talk to. And then um, the Firth of Forth site, I just identified by looking at Seagrass Spotter. So Seagrass Spotter is an app which uses citizen science to um, map seagrass and you can um, be part of that if you want. I think it's great fun. Um, and so I looked around the first fourth where there were various seagrass meadows and went to look at them. And this is the one that I chose, a black nest, which seemed appropriate. And it's also a triple SI, so a, a special conservation site for birds. Okay, um, now I just wanted to um, point out that this isn't work I did alone. It was a huge group effort and at every field site, I had at least one helper um, who absolutely saved the day every day um, and kept me going and carried things for me. Um, you can actually see Marie there um, in the middle, um, Marie and Lyle from Restoration Forth um, were my very first helpers on my very first bit of field work last year, uh, which was really nice. Um, this picture also just gives you a bit of a feel for what it was like on field work. I mean, it wasn't always this sunny, but it was a lot of paddle boarding or kayaking and um, snorkeling as well, of course. And um, yeah, I started with an inflatable kayak, but that went very badly. Um, so things had to be mixed up. Um, and I also um, sometimes did field work 
with some other people doing their own research. So in the bottom right there, you can see Ethan and Faria um, doing some filtering of water to collect DNA. Um, so they were looking at environmental DNA in the seagrass to look at invertebrates. Um, so yeah, it was really nice to be able to share my third work with different scientists and friends and yeah, meet lots of great people along the way. Um, yeah, so thank you to everyone who's been involved. Okay, um, this is a little overview of my very simple study design at each site. So I just had a seagrass plot and a control plot, which had to be the same size at each site, but they did vary in size between sites across the country, um, just because of what was possible with the shape and size of the meadows. Um, uh, so the control plot needed to be as similar in terms of depth and sediment type and distance from the shore as the seagrass plot. Um, so that sometimes made it difficult to decide where to put it, but it usually ended up, no, it was always some kind of sand and then sometimes bits of algae and um, rocks is mixed in there as well, but as similar as possible to the seagrass site as I could get. But this is a, a thing that where you put your control site can really change your results. So it's quite a crucial factor and something I'm, I'm going to have to think about really carefully in my analysis. OK, now this is going to be a little summary of my methods that I was doing at each site. So on the left, I've got a drawing representing some of the creatures I saw in the subtitle seagrass and on the right in the intertidal. And um, First of all, I wanted to characterize what the habitat is like. So I was looking at the density of the seagrass and its height using quadrats. And then I also took samples of seagrass to look at epiphytes. Um, so that's just algae growing on the seagrass. Then moving up the food chain, I was looking at creatures living in the seagrass. So um, um, first of all, I collected blades of seagrass with epiphoneurons, that's little snails and things living on the seagrass. And then I used um, baited cameras to look at fish and crabs living in the seagrass. Then moving up again, I was also looking at creatures visiting the seagrass to feed. So that's birds, seals and otters, which I did using visual surveys and cameras. And then finally, I was testing some novel monitoring methods, the bird cameras, as I just mentioned, and then also acoustics, which is where it gets quite exciting. Um, I was trying to listen to the sounds of crabs and fish making noises and I want to see if this is a way we can, um, like if we can use this as a method for monitoring biodiversity in a perhaps more efficient or just slightly different way. Okay, now I'm just going to take you through each of these methods one by one and show you how I did it and what some of my initial results are. So starting at the most basic and perhaps the least exciting, um, I was using quadrats to look at seagrass density, as I said, so I was dropping a quadrat 20 times in the seagrass site and in the control site and you can taking photos and you can see an example of the a photo that I would take in the subtitle seagrass and in the intertidal seagrass you can see it looks pretty different um, and then I would analyze that using a piece of software called coral point count which clearly was developed for looking at corals but you can use it for this as well um, so this is what it looked like if you look at the bottom picture on the right when I'm analyzing it in coral point count. So I got it to overlay a hundred points in a it's like random grid essentially um, over the photo. And then I go through every single point and um, say what is under that, whether it's seagrass or a type of algae or mud or stone or whatever. Um, and then I can look at percentage cover. Um, and then I was also looking at seagrass height, which I did using a ruler in the um, intertidal or a piece of string with the um, height bin, like height intervals of 10 centimeters up the string, um, which I used for estimating canopy height in the subtitle. Um, and this is just ooh, whoops, um, showing the variation in the structure of the habitat between sites. For example, Sky had less dense seagrass than Loch Craignish and Gintyre, and more of a mix of different types of algae and things. Um, that doesn't mean that's not necessarily a bad thing or anything. It's just a bit of a different habitat. Um, so then later on, I might be able to look and see if these types of differences are linked to differences in biodiversity at different levels of the food chain. Um, I just wanted to 
pause a bit and show you what an intertidal seagrass habitat looks like because I think often if you see pictures or videos of seagrass it's usually the subtidal seagrass but um, the intertidal can look a little bit less luscious like in that quadrat photo from before um, but I managed to get some nice pretty pictures in the sun here um, so the intertidal is a mixture of the two species of seagrass we have in the UK the subtidal is just the big one Zostra mariner but um, yeah, in intertidal we've got mariner, which is generally about 30 centimetres in length in that habitat, and um, nolti eye, which is more around 10 centimetres. And then you can see in the right um, what it looks like when it's mixed together and the tides coming in. Just to give you an idea what it's like, that photo is from Montrose Basin. Okay, um, now moving on to epiphytes. So epiphyte simply means a plant growing on another plant. In this case, it means algae growing on seagrass although algae is maybe not technically a plant, according to taxonomists. Um, so epiphytes can be a bit of an issue. Um, so when there's a lot of nutrient input into water from farming or sewage, etc., then it can lead to the algae blooming and growing a lot on the seagrass and shading it. So then the seagrass struggles to photosynthesize and it might die off. Um, so we want to look for epiphyte load as an indicator of there potentially being a problem. However, epiphytes are not all bad. Um, they're part of a natural ecosystem. There's quite a high diversity of different epiphytes around um, and they provide food and shelter for invertebrates. Um, so it's interesting to look at what's there to characterize the habitat. Um, so I used quite a simple method to quantify epiphytes, um, which I did just this year at my subtitle sites. I didn't do it across everything. Um, so what I did was I picked seagrass shoots from my quadrats, painstakingly scraped off the algae from the seagrass blades using microscope slides. And whoever was helping me had to help me with that as well, um, which was um, went down in a mixture of ways. Um, and then I dried the seagrass, so the seagrass and the algae separately, which I did in the oven in where I was staying, I had to do it immediately so it didn't rot and then properly back in the lab. And then I calculated the mass of the algae and the seagrass and looked at the proportion of algal mass compared to seagrass mass. Um, so interestingly, um, I found that there was a much higher algal compared to seagrass mass at Sky than at my other two um, subtitle sites, um, which is interesting. And most of that mass was due to this type of red algae that there's a photo of up there, um, which I think is a type of polysophonia algae. If there's anyone there who's an expert on algae, I would be really interested to talk. Um, but yeah, this red algae is like a naturally occurring thing and not um, thought to be associated with nutrient input as far as I know. Um, so that's why I was getting such higher masses of um, epiphytes at that site. However, if we look at Loch Fleet, which is the most northerly intertidal site, which I went to last year, um, unfortunately I couldn't visit it this year, um, there was loads and loads of green filamentous algae that you can see in this lower picture here, and that really seemed like it was smothering the um, eelgrass there. And that type of algae is associated with high nutrient inputs, so there is quite a lot of concern about that site, and um, they've documented great decreases in the seagrass algae, um, sorry, the seagrass area there in the last 20 years. Um, so I think it'd be really great if someone could look into that and try and fix it, if possible, I don't know. But um, I know the Nature Scott people there are aware of it. Um, unfortunately, it's not something I've been able to focus on at all, and I haven't even quantified it because I wasn't looking at epiphytes last year, but definitely something to flag. Um, and then I just wanted to add a general note of caution that epiphyte load changes a lot seasonally um, and even at one of my sites within the two weeks I was there you could see how much more epiphyte there was there by the end of the two weeks because it was so warm I think. Um, so I think this method could be really useful um, for example if you've got a seagrass restoration or conservation project and you want to look at epiphyte load repeatedly through the year or between years this is a really nice um, repeatable quantifiable method um, but for my study it's maybe not the most informative um, but that's all right 
Okay, moving on to epifauna. Um, so epifauna are just animals that live on seagrass in this case, um, and they feed on the epiphytes, or in some cases, actually the seagrass itself, but that's not so common, um, and they're food for fish and maybe other things. Um, so to look at the epifauna, I simply picked seagrass shoots again and preserved the whole um, seagrass with the epifauna attached in ethanol. Um, and I need to go and look at them under a microscope, which I haven't done yet, um, but it will be interesting to see what that shows. But I can just say here the kinds of animals I was seeing. Um, so there were lots of anemones, um, all I think these this snake locks anemone, which I've got a picture of in the bottom right. Um, also lots and lots of sea snails, um, particularly in the intertidal sites, absolutely covered in this little snail called Hyterobia. Um, some nudibranchs, so that's sea slugs, um, a few juvenile starfish, so this picture in the bottom left, um, I think those are um, juvenile common starfish, they're very sweet, and loads and loads and loads of snail eggs, especially later in the season, so that's the top left picture. Okay, moving up the food chain again to fish and crab diversity, I studied this using something called baited remote underwater video, shortened to brumps, um, which causes amusement and confusion in equal amounts, I would say. Um, and on the right is a picture of my one of my brubs. Um, so it's simply a GoPro on a stand with an arm, which the GoPro is looking at, and at the end of the arm is some bait in a cage. And I'm using mackerel, because that's the most commonly used bait for this kind of study. Um, and this is the kind of thing that you can make yourself. I've seen so many different types of brubs it's amazing how many different ways you can make a bruv. One of my friends made it out of a shopping basket. Um, but yeah, a very kind of DIY adaptable, but also very repeatable method. Um, so looking at fish is really difficult. There's no one method which will like allow you to see all of the fish in a habitat. So really you'd need to use lots of different ones at once. Um, but some advantages of using bruvs is minimize disturbance to the habitat. It's pretty easy to do and you can ensure accurate ID and that it can be consistent between studies. Um, but the disadvantage is that some species are going to be difficult to spot because they'll be hiding. And yeah, so there'll be some species that if you um, did netting or some other methods like DNA, you might um, get some species that you're going to miss by brubs. Um, so for this method, I put down one brub in the seagrass site and another in the control site at the same time and set them to record. And then later I will look at an hour of that footage because the GoPro will only last for about an hour and 20 minutes. Um, and then I repeated that four times last year and this time six times at each site. Um, so that produces a lot of footage to analyze and it can be quite time consuming. Um, so I created something called Brub Club um, where I managed to find a couple of people who were willing to help me analyze fish footage, which was really good fun. Um, right, now I just wanted to give you a little um, preview of the, not preview, a taste of the kinds of fish I was seeing in the video. So the top left square is different types of codfish and they were all juveniles. As I said before, it's um, seagrass as a nursery for fish. Um, so we've got pollock and safe, bib, um, cod, which I think are the cutest ones, um, and loads and loads of whiting often. Um, but this also varied a huge amount with the time of year. Um, so as you got a bit later in the season, there were many more fish to see. And then the top right, a couple of different types of rafts that were common, gold cine and cork wing. Um, saw a few flatfish, including this dab, which I really like. Um, saw a few sea trout, um, saw a few pipefish. The pipefish are really difficult to spot. They just look like a bit of seagrass. Um, so I'm sure there were many there that I didn't manage to see. Um, and then lots of gobies. Um, the, you get hundreds of these ones called two spot gobies, which swim in the water column. Um, and then lots of other gobies, which are sitting on the seabed, but they're difficult to identify in this kind of footage, but there'd be a mixture of sand gobies common gobies and painted gobies, I think, on the whole. Um, and then onto crabs. These are some of the common ones I saw. So loads of shore crabs. That's the top left. Um, quite a lot of velvet swimming crabs on the top right. And then quite a few hermit crabs as well. But there were 
I think maybe a few edible crabs and other things. Um, then this is some of my footage. This is probably my favourite snippet of footage that I've got for you. Um, just take the sound out. Okay, so this is two spiny dogfish, also known as spur dog. Um, this is footage from Sky from last summer. Um, it just makes me smile looking at it now. <laughs> um, so spur dog are sharks which are found quite broadly around the world in both the northern and southern hemispheres, but in temperate areas. Um, they should be really quite common and they hunt in packs apparently. Um, but unfortunately in the northeast Atlantic they're critically endangered. Um, so to be able to see these here, this is from Sky, is really fantastic to know they're around. Um, but of course they're probably not living in the seagrass so to speak, they came in because there was bait here. Um, but um, that's not unrealistic that they wouldn't use the seagrass meadow as a place to find food if there was some kind of thing for them to scavenge around. Um, and for reference in terms of size, that bait box is only maybe 10 centimetres long, so the, the sharks are maybe not as quite as big as they look. Um, okay, some initial results. I don't have much to show you on the um, that's processed for the fish and crabs yet, but this is from Sky from last year, which is where I saw the most fish in the videos, probably because I visited it latest in the year, to be honest. Um, but maybe also because it's more diverse, I'm not sure yet. Um, so the left-hand graph shows that the mean number of types of different fish and crabs was higher in the seagrass than the control site on average. And um, the left-hand bar on each pair is all species and the right-hand um, bar in each graph is um, just the fish. So you can see it's consistent for fish or fish and crabs. Um, and then the right-hand graph shows that the mean relative abundance of fish and crabs was also higher in the seagrass than the control site. So that's reassuring, it's kind of what I was hoping to see, but it's good to see it. Um, I haven't been able to do stats on this yet because the number of peats is so small, um, but once I've analysed the data from this year I'll have more repeats and then I think I should be able to do some statistics. Um, so yeah, take it all with a pinch of salt for now. Um, and then I also just wanted to say that the species composition, so the combinations of different species are quite different between the seagrass and control as well. So I found eight taxa that I didn't see in the seagrass at all and seven that, no, the other way around. I saw eight taxa that I only saw in the seagrass and seven that I only saw in the control. Um, so that shows that the seagrass is supporting some unique species that you just don't tend to see in the sandy areas at all. Um, but this also might be skewed by the fact that it can be quite difficult to spot species um, when there is seagrass because it literally hides things. Um, so if anything, it kind of makes the results more robust that despite the fact that it's harder to spot things in seagrass, you're still seeing more species. Okay, moving up the food chain once more to semi-aquatic predators. So there is quite a lack of data on the importance of seagrass as a hunting ground for larger animals. Um, in contrast, we have quite a lot of information on um, animals feeding on seagrass directly, so herbivores, so thinking about sea turtles eating tropical seagrasses and same with manatees. Um, and then in temperate areas you have widgeon and brent geese which absolutely hammer the intertidal seagrass and guzzle it up in the autumn. Um, so we know a reason about, about that, but in terms of animals coming to seagrass to catch other animals, um, that's not so much known about as far as I'm aware. Um, and so it's important because it's an evidence gap, I just find it really interesting, but also these are charismatic species which people tend to care about more and sometimes have higher protections um, in terms of a legal basis. So if we can show how important or if seagrass is important for these species as a feeding ground, then that's going to increase the argument for protecting seagrass and also hopefully be beneficial for these species themselves. Um, and then in addition, it would be great if we could work out if one of these species or some of them might be indicators of a healthy seagrass meadow. So if you see them feeding over that seagrass meadow, it might indicate that it's got a good fish population, for example. Um, so my method for looking at this was pretty simple. Again, um, 
I simply marked out my seagrass and control plot with boys, um, and then I watched the seagrass plot for 10 minutes, then the control plot for 10 minutes, and then switched between them for two hours. Um, and then I repeated that several times over a few days. And during that time, I was counting the number of animals present and whether or not they were feeding. Um, the only slight issue was that the boys, so I used um, armbands as boys, which actually was Marie's idea, funnily enough. Um, and it went brilliantly for a whole two years. And then at the last site, the seagulls, I, there was some juvenile herring gulls, which decided they wanted to pet the boys and they kept popping. Um, and it was really difficult. Um, but yeah, it's the kind of unexpected thing that happens on fieldwork. Okay, um, so here are my results from last year for the seals and otters. Um, so as you can see, I really didn't see very many overall, but what I did see is kind of reassuring in that um, I only saw one seal that looked like it might be feeding, so like diving down um, in the control sites, and that was at the Kintyre site of just talking about the subtitle sites here. Um, whereas in the seagrass sites, I saw many more seals and otters and um yeah although these are quite small numbers it's showing the trend that i would expect or hope for um and then i'll talk later about how i'm going to try and increase the sample size for this okay moving on to birds um this looks a bit confusing so just bear with me um these each of these graphs represents one of my subtitle field sites from last year um, and on the y-axis is the number of feeding birds seen per survey. And each line represents um, just one survey, unless it's got a little number by it, in which case it represents two surveys or four surveys. Um, and as you can see, the results here are pretty mixed. Um, so looking at Loch Craignish, the first graph, um, there are these three surveys where there were more red-breasted meganses seen in the control site than the seagrass site. Um, this might have partly been that I reckon just from watching them, it looked like these birds like to feed right on the border of the seagrass. Um, maybe that allowed them to sort of go into the seagrass, but be able to have a better view. Um, or maybe it really is that they just prefer feeding over the sand and that's fine. Um, yeah, it's just different between different species. And then looking at Kintyre, um, the only birds I saw feeding there were swans, um, and the swans eat the seagrass itself, and in the control site there really wasn't much that they could eat. Um, so that's also just what you expect, that they were only seen feeding when they were over the seagrass. And then at Sky, there's a bit of a mixture, but um, there was some indication that the shags were preferring to feed in the seagrass rather than the control site. And then to look at the intertidal sites as well, uh, at Montrose Basin, a bit of a mix again, um, but some indication the um, oyster catchers like the seagrass, but they also seem to like the control site quite a lot as well, which I think is because it was a kind of shingly rocky control site, which is what I was saying with the problem with what the control site is. Because um, my theory, what you'll see later as well, is that maybe the oyster catchers like to feed on kind of slightly rocky um, sand, shingly sand, um, and also seagrass, but maybe the shingle more, but they don't like to feed in mud quite so much. Um, um, so then if you look at Loch Fleet, there was a general trend of always having more birds in the seagrass than the control site, but um, yeah, which wasn't repeated at Montrose. And I think that's maybe because of the Loch Fleet, the control site was more muddy, um, but yeah more needs to be done to see if that's definitely true. Um, but yeah, overall, from the results from last year, there weren't that many birds seen. Um, so the number, the data is pretty like sparse, but there is some indication that shags, curlews, and oyster catchers might prefer feeding in seagrass. Um, and people have shown this before for curlew, um, but not for the others, I don't think. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. So, this year, I went back to Black Nest to do proper bird surveys. Unfortunately, I didn't have time last year to um, do it properly. Um, so th this year, I did many more hours of surveying. So I didn't do the alternating between looking at the two sites. We just watched consistently for two or three hours um, and did that seven times. Um, and 
that meant we just got really high bird counts. Um, and I think potentially also because we were visiting later in the year, we got much higher bird counts as well. And then this made me so happy. <laughs> um, got some really, really promising results. So if you look at this graph on the left, um, the y-axis is the number of feeding birds. And um, in the seagrass, the average number of birds was just much, much higher than in the control site. And there were clearly differences between the different species and with the stage of the tide. Um, so the, in, what happened was if you started with the tide up, the, most of the birds would be around the top of the tide. And then as the tide goes down, the birds generally follow the tide because um, they seem to like to feed where it's damp. Um, this is like waders and ducks and um, geese, um, not thinking about things like shags and gillywants right now. So they follow the water um, and then when they reach the seagrass, which was in a sort of band along the beach, um, they tended to just stop and they would be there for a while. And then they would have an absolute feasing frenzy for about half an hour and then they would kind of calm down a bit and um, eat like more intermittently and rest a bit more depending on the species. Um, and then some of them would keep following the tide down, but some of them wouldn't. Um, yeah, and then even as the tide was coming up, um, they still preferred the seagrass site over the control site, even though the control site was getting wet first. Um, so yeah, I need to pull apart this data more, but I'm fairly convinced that um, lots of these birds really like the seagrass site. Um, but yeah, it would be great to be able to repeat this and more sites and uh, different times a year to really show that it's true and I want to look at the different species um, but it's looking like really promising results to me. Okay, introducing the bird count. So as I said um, last year I got really low counts of birds, seals and otters um, so I thought the answer would be videos. Um, so I got together with some people from my uni and managed to pull this piece of equipment together. Well, I had two of them. Um, so it's just a camcorder in a case, um, uh, actually an underwater case, it didn't need to be, but it was second hand. Um, and then on the stand that I weighed down with sandbags, and then I could set the camera to run for up to 11 hours because I had some external batteries attached. And then I did that for about 10 days in a row, um, trying to catch different stuff parts of the day. So dawn, dusk, afternoon, etc. And this caused a lot of challenges. <laughs> Initially, I'd started the field work during the heat wave in June, which I was not predicting and the camera was not happy, but we managed to set up a system so there could be a vent so the camera wouldn't overheat, but it also wouldn't get drenched in the rain. Um, yeah, so it was, it's been quite an experience in understanding batteries, which I wasn't expecting to do in my PhD. Uh, yeah. and. We also call these the swans because from a distance they really look like swans um, and we got a lot of interested comments from people walking on the beach. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is a diagram showing how I worked out where the fields of view are of the different cameras. This is a picture of sky. Um, don't know why sky is coming up more than the other places. Um, <laughs> I'm sure Neil will be happy about that, but I guess it's the last subtitle that I went to. Anyway, um, so um, what I did was I stood by the cameras, which are on this rock here in the middle, um, and looked through the field of view and then got my friend to kayak out along the edge of the field of view and take a GPS point every time she crossed the edge of it. And that allowed me to work out where the edge of the field of view was, and now I can overlay that with um, a map of the seagrass and can work out um, when a bird is diving or seal or whatever in shot whether it's over seagrass or like where it is in the control site which should be pretty neat um, so this is an example of the kind of footage i'm getting um, so this is the control site at sky and over on the right is a shag that just dived. I hope it'll come up again in a minute. There it is. Um, so yeah, this is the kind of footage I need to analyse. Um, this is relatively easy because it's nice, calm conditions and the bird is close. But as you can imagine, 
when it gets stormy or when the bird is far away, it rapidly gets much more difficult. So my hope was to be able to do this analysis using some machine learning. There's a piece of software called Biggle, which can pick out objects from a background essentially. And I trialed that on um, some trial footage and it seemed to work pretty well, but I'm concerned that because my footage is so varied and what it looks like, that it would be really difficult to train the algorithm properly. Um, so it might be more or as efficient just to look through the footage at like high speed and spot the birds myself. Um, but I'll at least try the machine learning and see how it goes. But yeah, hopefully this method will increase my sample size um, compared to my just watching method that I did last year and I did a black nest, but it is all to be revealed. But at the very least, hopefully it's developing a new technique which might be useful for other people in the future. Because in terms of camera trapping, people do a lot of um, like infrared triggered camera traps and um, motion triggered or just um, time lapse where it takes a picture every like minute or something, but none of those methods really work for this particular purpose. So I'm kind of hoping that this could be a method that will be useful for other people in the future. Okay, moving on to the final section on acoustics. Um, so the underwater world is noisy. Um, I think most of us, including me, probably thought it was silent a lot of the time, um, but we've all heard about noise pollution interfering with whales and dolphins and things. And of course, lots of animals possibly almost all of them um, also make noises naturally underwater. Um, and there's big question in the marine conservation community at the moment, I would say of, um, can we use these sounds for monitoring? Um, so there's been some great research recently on um, using acoustics in coral reefs to look at biodiversity. So a paper came out showing that you can um, distinguish a restored or healthy reef from a degraded reef um, just by listening to the sounds going on with the fish and making noises etc. So that's really exciting and now various people including me are trying to apply this to other habitats and see if it will work there as well. Uh, so I had two hypotheses that I'm hoping to test. So first is, is the soundscape of a seagrass meadow distinguishable from that of unvegetated sand? And the second is, um, is greater biodiversity in fish and crabs, which I can measure using my video cameras, reflected in the soundscape? Are those, can we listen to the soundscape and assume that there's also, a, there really is a greater diversity um, if the soundscape is more complicated? Um, and soundscape, by the way, is just a term that means um, all the different sounds in an environment. So it could be natural or man-made. Um, and first of all, I wanted to give you a little intro into how fish make sound, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so the most common method is by vibrating their swim bladder in lots of different ways. Um, so the swim bladder is the organ they use to regulate their buoyancy. Um, and it's what evolved into lungs in mammals and things. Um, and some of the fish have something called a sonic muscle that you can see in that diagram, which when it contracts, it squeezes the um, swim bladder to make it make a noise. Um, and then the other main method they use is stridulation, which just means rubbing bones and teeth together. And the most common method they use for that is um, rubbing the pectoral fin against the shoulder girdle. So it's a bit like clicking your shoulder, I guess. Um, what's the purpose of all these noises? Um, there can be many different things, including courtship, um, territory defence, male competition, and synchronising gamete release between males, they think, as well as deterring predators. Um, but interestingly, like this sound production has evolved many, many different times in fish, um, and people think that it started accidentally as a byproduct of some other behavior, but then it evolved to be useful over the time and became exaggerated in how loud it was. Um, and that process is called something called, accept, I can't say it, exaptation, uh, which I think is quite useful. I mean, not useful, interesting, not particularly useful for everyday life. Um, okay, and then how do crustaceans make noise? Um, also stridulation, so rubbing their claws together and things. Um, Sometimes they contract muscles to vibrate their carapace. They can do something called wrapping, where they hit hard substrate with their claws. 
Um, or the pistol shrimp does something pretty awesome, which you, you might have heard about. Um, where, so they have these absolutely massive claws, which they contract so quickly that it squirts a jet of water out um, at a very high speed. And because the water is traveling so fast, um, the pressure drops, um, which creates cavitation bubbles. And then when those um, vapor bubbles implode because of the, so as the jet of water slows down again, the pressure increases and the bubble implodes, that creates a really, really loud noise, um, which can be up to 210 decibels at a distance of one meter, um, which is in comparison to a jet engine being 140 decibels. So it's kind of crazily loud. Um, yeah, and pistol shrimp are also known as snapping shrimp, which you have probably heard of, maybe. Um, so what's the point of these noises? Um, in the case of the pistol shrimp, it's um, to stun or kill prey. Um, they can stun fish doing this. Um, it can also be for communication. So I think it's some crabs use it for courtship. Um, or it could just be incidental noises with the crabs walking around or um, feeding. Um, so what did I do to study these sounds? Um, I got some microphones called audio moths. So that's the picture on the right shows that, um, as well as a crab kind of mocking my experiment, I think. Um, so uh, the audio moths were originally designed to be used to listen to bats and birds. And um, but then recently um, the company developed these underwater cases so we can start using them underwater, which is really great and has quite revolutionized um, research into underwater sound because um, it used to be you'd have to buy a hydrophone which costs several thousand pounds and now you can get an audio moth which costs a hundred or so um so i got some of these audio moths and put them on stands um i had three recorders in the seagrass and three in the control site and then i left them there for three days in a shallow area and then another three days in a control area sorry wrong word in a deeper area um, so I had six days of recording at each site. Um, and then for 12 hours in total, I had a brub down next to the audio moth. The hope being that I can match up my um, video footage to the sound and work out which animals are making which sound, um, which would be brilliant, but maybe not very easy to do. <laughs> um, so now I wanted to give you a little idea about the kinds of sounds I'm looking for or listening for. Um, so first of all, here are some fish grunts. It might be quite quiet, so just let's check this up. Um, yeah, listen. So that was some static and then a grunt. I'll just play it again. Yeah, so if you weren't aware, disappointingly, fish don't really go blub, blub, blub. They grunt usually. <laughs> okay, this is a slightly different one. It's a bit more like a kind of um, croak, <laughs> like a frog. Um, and then crabs. Here is a shore crab feeding. kind of metallic -y. So partly I think the sounds metallic because these two recordings have been taken in um, aquariums, not in the wild, which is why they know what animal it is making the sound. And this is a velvet crab doing some unknown behavior. Oh, whoops. Uh, is that a rat -a -tat -tat? Um, Okay, so that's what we're listening for. And then this is what I actually heard. Um, so the, this is a collection of sounds which I've sort of strung one after another um, rather than being like a natural thing that you would hear. Just so you can hear a very variety of the kinds of things I'm hearing. I think these are all from Loch Craigenish from this year. Um, and then I've just annotated the um, diagram with the kinds of like, so these three are the same kind of sound, I think. By the way, this is called a spectrogram. Um, so it's frequency, which is just pitch over time, and then the colour represents how um, loud the sound is. Okay, 
Yeah, so that's pretty interesting. <laughs> um, this, I think, is a fish grunt. Pretty much everything else, I'm not sure what it is at all. Um, the pew sounds suspiciously dolphin-y, but I'm not sure about that. Essentially, I need to look into it more. But it might just be, I can't say what they are, but if I can say these are repeatable sounds, then that's still interesting. And if I'm pretty sure they're made by an animal, not by a boat or something. Um, so the way I'm going to analyse this is in two main ways. Um, firstly, phonic richness. So that just means um, counting the number of different types of sounds I'm hearing. Um, and that could be a proxy for species richness. Um, so the number of different species, even if one species makes a few different sounds, it will still be hopefully correlated with the number of different types of animals you've got in the area. And the second method is acoustic indices. So these are statistics um, which are actually developed in terrestrial habitats, um, which summarise how varied a um, sound clip is in terms of wavelength and amplitude and things. Um, and people have looked at this in a few different marine habitats and it hasn't correlated that well with the level of biodiversity. Um, but I'm going to see if it works in seagrass. Um, but yeah, there are potentially problems with wave sound interfering and um, current sound. Um, so yeah, we'll see how it goes. Um, but the idea would be if you could put down a microphone, take a recording, um, maybe calculate some acoustic indices, calculate um, your phonic richness using a nice machine learning algorithm that someone develops in the future um, and then get an indication of how diverse the soundscape is and then have an understanding of how that relates to how biodiverse the habitat actually is. Um, okay, we're almost there. Um, so as I said, I wanted to match up video to audio, but this is proving quite difficult because the um, microphone listens all around in 360, um, whereas the video only looks at a small section of um, the 360 view. So it's really difficult to tell what is making what sound. Um, but I realized the crabs really liked crawling on or under or up my stands, um, which is something I didn't really predict. Um, and that makes quite a lot of noise on the metal. Um, so I thought at the very least, I'd be able to isolate that sound and then maybe build things up from there. Um, so I managed to get extra GoPros and have two GoPros on my bravs, one facing the bait and one facing down to the stand. Um, and this is an example of the kind of footage I got. Um, this here is a, um, uh, sorry, I've had a blank, um, a spider crab, a type of spider crab covered in algae. And then in a minute, you're gonna see a short crab falling down here. He's just climbed up before. Um, and then he's gonna climb up again and he does this about three times. Um, very determined little crab. Um, I assume it's climbing up to try and get like good current into its um, mouth so it can filter feed, but I don't know. Um, and then this is what I heard on the audio moth at the same time. Get this forward a bit. <laughs> so this sounds like it's snuffling. Anyway, so that I am pretty certain is the sound of the crab climbing up this stand. Um, so, and this is what that looks like on the spectrogram. So the, all these vertical lines are it climbing up. Um, so what am I gonna do with this information? One thing I could do is filter it out because maybe I don't want this sort of metallic sound interfering with the more natural sounds. Um, I could also maybe use it to estimate the density of crabs between different areas. Um, because assuming wherever you are, the crabs are going to crawl on the stand, you could get some kind of measure of crab density quite accurately, maybe then. Not actual density, but relative density. Um, but my ideal would be to identify the sounds of the crabs when they're not on the stand. But maybe because I can see the point at which the sound 
is the crab climbing on the stand. And then I can look at the bit before that where the crab is about to climb on the stand. I might be able to really isolate that sound, which would be really exciting, um, but we'll see how possible that is. Um, okay, that's pretty much it. Um, I was just gonna say what's next for me. I need to spend a lot of time extracting data from my video footage and my sound recordings. Uh, and then I wanna analyze the data to do lots of things, including comparing species diversity between the seagrass and the control plots um, and see if it's consistent between different trophic levels or like levels of the food chain. Um, and I want to look at the variation in diversity between sites. What is the kind of range of variation we get across these sites in Scotland? Um, and then I'd like to look at correlations between diversity at different levels of the food chain. Um, and are there any species which would be potentially good indicator species? So if we just studied that species like otters, say, or pollock, or whatever it is, I don't know, um, does that indicate that the rest of the ecosystem is likely to be relatively diverse as well? Um, that's a pretty open question. And then finally, I want to look at the efficacy of the novel moth methods I've been testing. So. Um, the bird video um, and the soundscape analysis and try and um, give suggestions of how people could maybe develop that further in future. Okay, that is it. Um, thank you so much for listening. I hope it's been understandable and interesting. Um, and if you want to ask questions, that's all good. Um, should I pass to Maru?